Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. How's it going, everybody? I'm Taylor. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Taylor! And Nikki uh, asked me to speak a couple hours ago, so I haven't had much time to think about this, which may be a good thing. Um, I guess 10 minutes is enough to give you a quick synopsis of my life, or my drinking history and all that, and what's going on now. So uh, I guess I'll just start from the beginning and tell you I grew up in a house where there was a lot of drinking. Uh, my father owned a bar. And uh, when my parents drank, there were a lot of parties in my house. And when my parents drank, it was fun for the kids, too. <laughs> so I always equated drinking with fun. Uh, from a very early age, I would, I would drink my milk the way I saw my father drink his beer. I mean, I watched the way he drank it, how he sipped it, everything. And... Uh, and they were pretty liberal with it. I mean, he would ask me to go get him a beer, and I'd say, if I get a sip. And he'd say, sure. And I loved the taste of beer for the very first time I drank it. Um, and then uh, I had my first drink, and I think I drank alcoholically very early on. Uh, it was a rapid progression for me. Um, when I was just, uh, I don't know how old I was, I was very young, and I'd stand in front of stores and ask for, and try to ask people to buy me beer. And I'd ask for a case. And I was a little kid, and they were like, this isn't all for you, is it? And I'd say, no, no, of course, we have a big party. And they'd say, okay, that case was for me. So I would drink a six-pack, and it would get me completely hammered, and then I'd save the other three. Um, but my, really, my drink had really turned. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, I grew up in New Hampshire. It was a small town. I grew up, my parents told me, say, hello, sir, to everyone you pass on the street, good, you know, good morning, ma'am, or miss, or what have you. And I would do that. And then my parents split up. I moved to New York City at the age of 13. And there, people don't say good morning, ma'am, and good morning, sir, to every person they pass. I actually subsequently saw this uh, crocodile Dundee in which he's doing that. And that's exactly what I did until this couple of Puerto Rican kids threatened to tear my head off. And I was like, oh, I guess you don't do that here. Hello is offensive to people here. Eye contact was offensive. So it was a big change for me. And not only that, I was 13. And I was 13 going on 13. And the kids in New York City were 13 going on. I don't know what. But the girls were... Every, all the kids have had sex, or if they didn't, they were better at lying about it than the kids that I knew back home. And they all smoked cigarettes and did drugs and were pretty sophisticated. They're going to clubs. So I felt like I had catching up to do, just to hang out with people. And uh, one of the ways that I caught up was through drinking and drugs. And uh, early, in, I, a lot of you have heard this story, I think, but uh, early in my drinking, or early after moving there, my father asked me to go buy him a six-pack. So I went down to the store, and I put a six-pack on the counter. And my father told me, tell him it's for me. I said, this is for my father. And uh, he sold it to me. And the next day, I went back down. I got another six-pack for me. But I said, this is for my father. And he sold it to me again. And the next day, I went down. I put the six-pack on the counter. I said, I'm not going to say anything. Let's see what happens. He sold me the city. And it was all over. I didn't know at 13 you can buy alcohol in New York City. I don't know if it's still that way, but you could then. And uh, and I was 13 who probably looked like I was 10. I don't know how old I looked, but I looked young. But uh, so daily drinking started early for me. And uh, as I said, the kids I was hanging out with were much more sophisticated. And uh, drugs soon followed. And my life was a quick decline. As I said, I drank alcoholically very early on, and I there were things that I was keeping secret about my drinking, and one that I remember so well was if I was drinking with somebody and there were just a few beers left, if there were three beers left, I wanted to find a way to get the other two and make sure they didn't get the other two. And you couldn't tell anybody that. And there were just moments throughout my drinking, even early, where I had this desperation for alcohol and I was with other people, and I couldn't tell them that I had that desperation. I was just dying for it. And uh, But uh, the wheels soon came off. I mean, I, it occurred to me recently, actually, the first time in my life that I actually felt absolute utter peace in my life was uh, at this point, my drinking had progressed, drugs had progressed, and I was living in a hotel. 
and it was five dollars a day and I guess it goes without saying that we're not international flags hanging off the front of these hotels. It was uh, on the Bowery in New York City, and uh, a guy who was standing up front, I had nothing in common with him, and he asked, I was sober, he was sober, he asked if I wanted to beg for change to get a quart of beer, and this peace washed over me, and I thought, I don't have to pretend to be anything with this guy. I can just be an alcoholic. And what a relief that was for me. And it changed the course of my drinking. From that point on, I sought out places where I would not have to pretend. I didn't drink in bars because you had to pretend to be funny or smart or drive a nice car. I don't know what you had to pretend, but I wasn't up for it. I was up for drinking, and I was up for drinking with people who understood that that's what we were doing. Um, so that led to a really rapid decline. Um, i got to speed this along here. My life changed when I, I moved back to New Hampshire to get away from drugs, to be honest. That's why I went there. And I walked onto a construction site and got a job, and it turned out to be my worst nightmare. Every person in that crew was in AA, and I was drinking. <laughs> and I'll never forget this guy with this tiger tattoo running up his arm, Fu Manchu mustache, and I said, you want to go to lunch? And he said, sure. And I said, you want to stop in the bar? And he said, no, I've seen what it's done to my family. I don't drink. But, I saw what it did to my family. I was all for it. I was like, I don't know. This is a, you saw what it did with your family. You don't want to drink. So that was a new concept. But anyway, uh, at that point, I was starting to get some of the symptoms of alcoholism without knowing it was a symptom of alcoholism. And one of those was panic attacks. I'd stand in the store, and I'd fumble for change, and I'd be dying to get out of there, and thinking everybody standing behind me was watching me shake and freak out. And, uh, and I started to question, what is an alcoholic? And uh, started to ask these guys that I worked with. And I finally made it to AA, to speed this along. And I was in AA for 16 years. And uh, I still wish I knew why I went out drinking. I mean, there were a whole bunch of things. I stopped going to meetings. I didn't pray. I mean, talk about not expanding your spiritual life. I was not doing that. And, uh, and I went back out. And uh, I thought, with everything I knew, I thought the self-knowledge was the answer. With everything I knew about myself and the emotional maturity I gained, I mean, I got sober when I was 22, I was just a kid. And then, uh, now I'm much older, you know, I couldn't possibly make those same mistakes. And lo and behold, I found myself in the very same places that I had been before. Uh, I was drinking and uh, using drugs down in San Francisco at the 16th admission for the Tenderloin, or one, one or the other. And uh, I don't know. When I quit drinking this time, I think it could have kept. I could have kept going, but it was. It, I knew the end was in sight. I knew the. I knew I was hitting a point in which uh, some of you have heard this before. Uh, near the end of my drinking, homeless people stopped asking me for change, and they'd look in my eyes and say, "Hey, what's up?" And I felt like, yeah, it's not long before I'm on that side of the equation, looking at uh, standing there asking for change. So now I'm in AA. I come back to AA, thankfully, and miracle of miracles, one, just showing up here, the obsession to drink stopped, and that was miraculous to me. And I have not had the obsession to drink since coming back to AA, and I think it was just because I, I don't know why, I was honest with someone, number one, I was honest with my wife to tell her what I was doing, and, uh, and I wanted help. And now... I don't know what to tell you. Uh, my life is getting better, but I guess the thing I could say about AA is uh, it's asking a lot. It's asking not much in terms of, I mean, for what I get back in terms of going to a meeting once in a while and working the steps and meeting with a sponsor, I get a lot back for the little I do there. Where it's asking a lot is uh, every idea I had about everything is being challenged. Every idea I had about myself and who I was is being challenged. Every idea about how I thought the world worked is being challenged. And I think being challenged in a good way. Uh, but that's what's going on for me. And sometimes it feels like I'm a teenager again. And sometimes it's kind of scary. I was actually at a, a, a commitment, an H&I commitment. And one of the guys at this H&I commitment was a rough crowd. And one of the guys actually had the courage to ask, and he was hemming and all. He talked for a while. He said, do you know what I'm saying? I said, no, I don't. But keep going. I'll try. And finally, he came out and he said, is it scary getting sober? I said, oh, man, man. That's a good question. Yes, it is. And it takes a type of courage that I did not, I didn't see it coming. I didn't expect it. I thought people who didn't drink were weak. And I thought it was strong that people were out there partying. And I think I had the equation backwards. And that's what I'm finding out in the end is I had a lot of equations backwards. And, uh, 
Now I'm trying to live a different life, and I think I've gone over my 10 minutes, and it's time to introduce our main act. Big hand for everybody for Willie. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Willie. I'm a grateful alcoholic. Boy, I'm kind of nervous, you know? Bathroom's right there in case I have issues, but hopefully I won't. Um, I got sober on March the 4th. I think it was March the 4th. It could have been the, the 3rd, but um, I figured the 4th will just keep you covered on that. Ni uh, 1990, I came into these rooms. Um, I have a sponsor that I talk to every week, and I... Uh, reach out and work with other alcoholics on a daily basis. And that keeps me sober. I mean, there's a lot of other things that keep me sober. So, um, to start out, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like I'm doing my four step all, all of a sudden because I really hemmed and hawed at my four step and my, my sponsor just said, just okay, you were born and, you know, so 76 pages later I had my four step. But, so, um, you know, I was actually born because my dad wanted a car. And my mom wanted another kid. So there it went. And they, my mom was a pretty heavy drinker. You know, she never really thought she had a problem with it because she started at 10 in the morning. And so I, I grew up um, learning how to be able to drink and uh, still be sociable and, you know, work and all that kind of stuff. And in fact, there's uh, family pictures of me just like a three-year-old with a big bottle of whiskey with a big grin on my face. And, you know, I remember those days. I remember the burning going down my throat and how it just made me feel really happy. You know, and that's how I was growing up. You know, I had to be the, the clown and I, you know, um, needed to fit in all the time. And, you know, I, I didn't always fit in, you know, because I had these voices in my head that, you know, told me that I was a piece of shit and that, you know, I, you know, was, should just be a loner and all that, that stuff that went around in my head, you know, um, and so, um, I started drinking, uh, because there was a family tragedy that happened and there was a family that came to live with us and, um, and as, uh, my stepsister stepped over her, you know, got out of the house, she grabbed a bottle of vodka. And when she got to our house, she was like, let's go drink this bottle. And I was like, yeah. So we went out to the schoolyard, and we drank this bottle of vodka. I was 12. I think she was 11. And um, I, I, was, I felt so at home. I didn't get sick. I was happy. I didn't have a care in the world. And um, it took me three years at the age of 15 to totally destroy my life. Um, you know, I drank all the time, I, you know, as, as a 12 year old, you know, I'd stay out till three, four in the morning. I would drink before I went to school, I drank during school, I drank after school, I drank all the time. Um, there are drugs in my story. And so I, I had that to help me stay up, you know, um, actually the first time I smoked pot, I didn't get stoned. So my friend gave me a tap of acid. So I... <laughs> got to uh, have that fun little trip, and, um, you know, but I want to stick to alcohol. Um, so by the age of 15, I uh, just, my folks had no idea how to talk to me. You know, um, they'd wait up for me at first, and then after a while, they just let me come in and you know, do my thing. And so at 15, they decided to give me away, because um, they couldn't handle me. And so I was... Um, they were either going to give me away to the state, um, or they were going to give me to this family that I used to be able to talk to the mom and the parents, right? And so if I was talking to the parents, there must be something good about that. Well, the thing is, is that my friend, his folks were into drinking a lot of wine and uh, dropping a lot of speed. So um, I was, of course, pushing it towards, like, I'll go, you know, stay with them. And... Um, and so that's, you know, that's what I did. And, and, you know, I think I'll just touch a little bit between those three years. You know, I had, I was running from something all the time. You know, that feeling of just, if I stayed in front of those feelings that I was having of total fear, you know, total anger. I mean, I was just running the gamut, not able to really identify what I was feeling. Um, 
You know, I would, uh, you know, I, if I drank, it just didn't really matter what I was feeling and none those feelings. And it just reminded me, when you were talking, I used to, at this time, I grew up in Huntington Beach, a beach town. I was at the beach all the time. And my dad got transferred to St. Louis. So I was out in the middle of the Midwest. You know, but then I was a towhead with the blue eyes, and, you know, they all thought I surfed. Um, and we used to go to this bar, Ida's Bar. And all you had to do is just show some identification, like the act of showing something, and she'd serve us whatever we wanted. And we'd get cases of Schlitz malt liquor, and we would just drink those things up like there was no tomorrow, and we would be driving, and, you know, the whole crazy just put our, our lives in peril. And um, like I said, it was just that feeling of trying to stay one step ahead of, you know, Feeling really sad, actually, is, is what I was feeling. Um, so at the age of 15, um, I got given away. So I felt that was a perfect opportunity to drop out of high school. Um, I actually changed my name to Sarah because I could pick any name. I was like this whole new person. And I bought myself a stingray. I got my first job. I worked in print shops, sweeping the floors. I got my first bike. My mother would never let me have a stingray bike. So I bought a stingray bike. <laughs> Changed my name to Sarah. Didn't go to school. <laughs> and, um, and I'd go out into the country on my bike and just act like, you know, my mind. You know, my mind just had fun games with itself. And I just had this imaginary life going on like I was in the Civil War. And, <laughs> and uh, just kind of get lost. And somehow find myself, you know, get myself back to the house, you know, for dinner, and, um, you know, that went on for a lot of years, you know, um, they tried to send me to, to therapy, but, you know, I would just shut down and not talk at all, so they thought I was even crazier than really what I, what I was, you know, as an alcoholic, you know, without any solution, um, and so... That took a, a couple of years where I just got too crazy with for them, you know. I was just too out of control for them. And so they shipped me back to my folks, you know, and they had since moved back to Huntington Beach. And so I went back there, and it was a total foreign world to me, you know, because, um, you know, I had to be a little bit accountable to what I was doing. At least I thought so. At first, you know, at first I thought I had to, and, you know, they, they sent me to uh, the junior college down there, so I got credits and got a high school diploma, um, but I was, like, had to be part of the family again, you know, and, you know, it was just, I think it was just, I, I don't really remember because I was pretty wasted at that time, but I think it was a couple of weeks, within a month, that I was back to just getting loaded all the time. You know, and I'd come home, and I'd have to go up the stairs to my bedroom, and, like, I'd be pushing myself up the stairs, you know, and I remember this. And, like, I would never, there, would, there was never any consequences for me, you know. And um, I did, you know, the thing is, is that I drank a lot. And there was a lot of years I had no idea what I was doing. I have no memories. I mean, I have, you know, little snippets of, you know, kind of, I almost hit someone in the crosswalk or, you know, or something like that. And, um, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't really last that long in my folks' house and I moved out and, um, you know, did the, just drank all the time. I was running to myself, you know, um, and, uh, I ended up leaving Huntington Beach and, um, through a job, I was working out in Phoenix, and I moved to Phoenix because I could smell the dirt. Because back in the back in the seventies, if you were, you know, if anyone knew Southern California, it was just small. You know, it was just like and it was so thick with smog, you couldn't smell anything. So I was working in Phoenix. I went out to Phoenix, and it's like, you know, I could smell the dirt. And um, I called. I called my boss. And I said I quit. <laughs> You know, I had his car, the company car. And all that. <laughs> I didn't see any issues with that. I thought, you know, I was I was fine in my head. I was fine, you know. Um, I didn't think I affected anybody. You know, I was um, I was feeling very alone, very alone, but surrounded by people. I always had a lot of friends. I was always surrounded by a lot of people, but inside. 
deep down in my heart, I was all alone. And um, I moved out to Phoenix, and I took two jobs, and I still drank at the bars because they stayed open until four. You know, and, and uh, out there, you can, like, drive off the road, and you'll just be in the dirt, and you'll just like, <laughs> You know, and I, you know, it was, it worked for me, you know, for a year, but I missed the ocean too much. You know, I had to have that serenity of the ocean that the ocean gives me. And, um, you know, it took me, um, you know, just I, I had a friend that was going to drive up to Santa Cruz, a family friend in Huntington Beach. Probably, I'm, hey, you want a ride? I go, yeah, I'll get a ride. And I had uh, five bucks in my pocket, and I had my dog, and I got this ride. And we stopped in Vegas, and I put a nickel in the slot machine in the grocery store and won, you know, 50 bucks. Went to the casinos, got 700 bucks, and by the time I actually hit Santa Cruz, I had my dog, and I think about $50 in my pocket. And, um, and you know, it was, it was a good thing. I was living down by the boardwalk. I, was, I knew where all the bars were that were open at 6 in the morning, 6.30 in the morning. I always had a stash of alcohol under the bed. I drank at all the bars, and I would do anything for a drink for any of you to buy me a drink or give me a drink, or I'd just steal your drink. <laughs> and I never thought I had a problem. You know, I never really thought that I had any issue with alcohol. You know, I had an uncle that, you know, used to always have bottles in the trunk of his car, and he'd do silly things, and I thought that was the alcoholic. I thought the alcoholic was, you know... You know, a bum in the street, you know, that was, you know, didn't take showers and, you know, was really dirty. And that was an alcoholic. You know, I had no really clue what it was. And and so, you know, I, I did quite a few. I did 20 years of, of pretty good drinking. You know, I um, actually found myself homeless. You know, I had a car, a Ford Fairlane. And uh, it was parked right on Rick Street, right off Mission Street, with no air in its tires. And all my clothes, all my worldly possessions, which were clothes, were in the back seat. And I'd climb into the back of my car, sleep under my clothes. And that's, you know, and I didn't think I had any problem. I'd, you know, get up when the same sun came up and there was a McDonald's down the street and I'd wash up in McDonald's. You know, and um, I did that for about a year. But, you know, like I said, I really didn't have any issues. And, you know, every once in a while, this friend of mine would let me crash at their house, and I'd, like, go there at 3 in the morning. I, you know, for years, I was doing this 3 in the morning thing. Um, you know, and I'd crawl and sleep on her sofa, and, you know, I had to make amends to her and her family because she had a young kid then, you know, and I, you know, I'm sure I wasn't the quietest person around. And, you know, there was there was a lot of things like that that happened, you know. Um, you know, it was all about the drink, and it was all about taking being one step ahead of what I was feeling. And, um, you know, even uh, during that time, I got a drunk driving, and it was, you know, some celebration. We won the softball game, and we went and drank quite a few pitchers of beer, and then we went to some bar, and then, you know, we were, you know, doing donuts on Mission Street, and, you know, and I think I was doing donuts on Highway 1, too. It was, you know, I, I like to do donuts in my car, and I, was, I felt like I really knew how to handle a car, and um, it always helped me a lot, too, if I had my dog in my car, because my dog would help me find my the way home, like the dog would look down the street that I used to go to. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was pretty smart. I was pretty smart. And, you know, I, I managed to get home or get to where I needed to go. And, um, you know, I, I got this drunk driving, and, and part of the program at Janice is that one of the means you have to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And I, you know, was totally against that. I had no idea about, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I missed the next week of having to tell your story about going to a meeting. And so I made that one up, and, you know, the when I did, I was like, you know, mumble, 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 mumble something. And um, when the classes ended, uh, my friend showed up with a bottle of champagne and a car. And, uh, that's, that's, that was my little glimpse of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I beat the system, you know, that I didn't go there. And... Um, you know, it's it was, you know, life happened. Life, life happened. There was a lot of life happening around me. And finally there was a, 
an evening where I was in a bar and um, there was a group of people that were celebrating something and I just wanted to find out what, you know, I wanted to make, you know, do my little scam and uh, see what kind of drinks I could get. And um, I found out that it was, they were, it was a dance club too. And so I found out that it was, you know, this person's one year AA anniversary. <laughs> you know, and I was like, well, they're a friendly group, you know? I could probably have some fun with them, you know, of having something to drink. Not alcoholic, but, you know, there's something to drink. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a funny, it was a fun dumb night. I don't, who knows? Who knows why I, this happened, you know? Um, you know, because mainly I, I, I like going to that particular bar because I could do a quick run around the corner um, off the main street there downtown, and uh, if I had too much alcohol, I could, um, I could like, throw up in the gutter. So I could drink some more. And I was a pretty classy drinker. <laughs> so I was really classy. I, you know, never drank Budweiser. It was always, you know, the Bexer, Heineken, and, you know. Um, I did have quite a relationship with Jack. Um, in fact, my mother had told me that she was going to send me call to college. She had stock in Jack, Jack Daniels. And so when I was drinking, you know, it was, Jack was my choice. Um, because it was to my education. <laughs> and uh, we did have quite the, the relationship going on, me and Jack. But anyways, back to this, uh, this celebration for the one-year anniversary. I, I ended up uh, taking this person home, you know, because that was a thing that I used to love to do. <laughs> and um, it, didn't, it didn't really last all that long. It was maybe a week or two. It's always a week or two, because I don't mean that <laughs> Wrong. A week or two, 20 years pass, a week or two. Um, and, uh, you know, this person couldn't hang out with me anymore, you know, because I was drunk all the time. I was loaded all the time. And they gave me their phone number. And they said, here, call me if you ever want to go to a meeting about all the songs. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I stuffed it in my pocket. And, um,. You know, it, it didn't take me too long, that much longer. I know that it was a month. <laughs> it took me a month. And I was, um, you know, I, I uh, towards the end, I would stop drinking on my own. You know, I was quite proud of myself, and I'd tell my friends, I'm not drinking. You know, I did other things, I'm not drinking. Um, but there was, you know, things would happen. Someone would look at me funny, and I'd have to have a drink hidden in my car, you know, or... You know, if you, someone said the wrong thing or, you know, some relationship went sour again. They didn't love me anymore. And I had to start drinking. And, um, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was sober for a couple weeks. Um, then 89 earthquake happened and I thought that was a great excuse, uh, <laughs> to really go on my last bender. And, um, you know, I, uh, you know, cause I, I got to see a lot of, you know, I've lost some friends in Santa Cruz uh, through the earthquake and you know that was a good that was a good excuse um, to really tie one on and really get really drunk and it took me till March of the following year to be on my hands and knees and drag myself to a meeting and what had happened is that um, I had um, tried to ward off the drugs and of course was still drinking and I ended up on Westcliff one morning at 7 in the morning and, uh, you know, like I said before, I was a real classic drinker. I never really drank Budweiser. That was just cheap stuff. And I was there with a Budweiser in my hand. And um, about five years before that, on West Cliff, I lost my younger sister to alcoholics, uh, alcohol, drugs and alcohol. And um, I came to, uh, I, I had a moment of clarity. And um, it was, I had a choice. You know, I had a choice of either I was going to get some help or I was going to die. And I was really too chicken to die. I really was. I was, I was not my thing. Um, suicide is uh, rampant in my family. You know, from way back, my grandmother, my great aunt, you know, it's, it's, it's in my family. And um, I, I just didn't want to take that route. And so I had to get some help. 
And for some unknown reason, I still had a phone number in my, in my pocket. And I made the phone call, and um, I, I went to my first meeting that night. It was a women's meeting at 7 o'clock, and, you know, it was down in the flats, and I had to go up Laurel Street Hill. I don't know if you know that. It's a really steep hill. And I'm like, oh, you know, I really am, like, going to any lengths to, like, get to so. Because I'd been up all night. You know, I was pretty burnt out. You know, um, but I was really determined, and um, I went to I went to that meeting and uh, walked in the doors, and I swore there was some money exchanged. I really do because there were there were people in there, you know, because I'd been in Santa Cruz for so long. Um, I think there were some bets that were made that I really would never walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, I had arrived. And the first meeting, um, 22 years ago, was about the first step. And um, I totally found serenity. I didn't know what it was, you know. I, feelings. I didn't know feelings. I was running from feelings. I didn't know how to identify any of my feelings. Uh, but I felt really serene. And the, the big thing for me is like, and I had said that, I said it earlier, is that I was um, surrounded by a lot of people. I had a lot of friends. I was always, you know, out there amongst a lot of people. But deep down inside, I felt so alone. You know, so scared. And um, they were talking about the first step, and the first word is we. And, like, I, I didn't have to do it alone. You know, I could do it with other people, and I could go through this process with other people and not by myself. And that really just took me right in. And, um, you know, I, I grabbed a hold of a group of people that had, you know, some sobriety, and I still have friends with them. Um, and they walked me through how to do this thing, you know. I followed in their footsteps of the, you know, the people that had done the steps that have deal with, you know, had deal with feeling their feelings and not going out there and drinking again. Um, and I had to, I had to quit my job because I would drink with my friends at work, you know. I was friends with everyone. Um, you know, and it was too hard. I didn't know how to, like, tell them, hey, I'm sober now. That was too scary for me. You know, it was like this reputation I had, you know, of the old person with the great butt and the alcohol, always had alcohol. And so I quit my job. Um, I went to meetings all the time. Um, even in Santa Cruz, they would even let me go to the men's meetings. <laughs> um, because I was that desperate alcoholic that needed to have the fellowship of a meeting. Um, and it took me, uh, it took me about six months to get a sponsor because I just swore that she was going to say, oh my God, no, no, you're the, you know, you're, you're a hopeless person. And, um, you know, of course she, of course she said yes. And, um, you know, we went through the steps. We went through the 12 of 12, um, page by page. And it took me a really long time to do that long 76 page or step. And it took me a few hours to read it, and her and her dog listened to me the whole time. And they didn't run out of the room and say, oh, my God, here one sick individual. Because that's what I thought, you know. It was like, I, I really thought that I had, you know, I, I had really deep, dark secrets, you know. And these secrets of what I've heard, you know, in the, the meetings that I went to, that's what will get you drunk again, are your secrets. And... Um, that new feeling, you know, that was, that was scary, too. It's like, oh, you could do happy pretty good, but sad was kind of scary. Um, you know, and uh, amazingly enough, I, I've uh, kind of done the full step circle. That same sponsor is my sponsor today, you know, and we get to still do things, and I still call her at 8 o'clock, and my arm goes off, and I'm like, yeah, um, and life still happens, you know, when I got sober, um, I uh, was able to go back into so society and have a job and keep a job and show up on time and get a car and have air in the tires and <laughs> drive my car with gas and have insurance and, you know, try to be a, you know, an active, participate in life, in my own life, my own sobriety, and other people's sobriety, too. 
And, um, you know, they, like I said, life still happens. Um, when I was three years sober, I was out in, um, I was out in Hawaii with my family because there was about eight years. I couldn't talk to my family at all. I didn't talk to them. I was too pissed off at them. You know, they gave me away when I was 15 when I was vulnerable. <laughs> How can they do that to me? And so I, I disappeared for a while and, um, it still affects my mother to this day. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I actually accepted going to a trip to Hawaii, and my older sister went along. And my older sister had some major health issues, and she ended up leaving early. And it was the last day of being in Hawaii. It was the first time I'd ever been there. It was paradise. And um, right before I took the flight, five hours before the flight, I um, found out that she had killed herself. And... Um, Usually I leave that part out that I just say kind of this thing happened because it's a sad thing. You know, when someone takes their life, it's, you know, it affects a lot of people. It's a really sad thing. And now I have my opinion that I think it's a very selfish thing, but um, I don't want to stand on a bandstand on that one. But anyway, so I, I, I really thought when I got on that plane, it was five hours long, that I knew I had the best excuse to get drunk. And I was going to get drunk. There was no one, none of my friends back then, you know, cell phones were really big. <laughs> in a suitcase type of thing. And um, I, you know, I was going to get drunk. That was it. You know, I could start over. Well, you know, I wasn't even thinking about starting over, but I was like, I, I need a drink. Because I was so unbelievably sad, you know. And I didn't know, you know, those feelings, those feelings that kept chasing me behind it. I kept running from all my life. And um, I got on that plane, and my dad, of course, told all the flight attendants that, you know, watch out, you know, keep an eye out on her, she's stuck, and things happen. You know, so embarrassing. <laughs> that was everybody's, you know, everybody he runs into, my life story. But <laughs> So I got on this plane, and this woman across the aisle from me throws up all over the place. <laughs> she, like, his, was coming home from her honeymoon, had not eaten anything, and drank a bunch of orange juice and whatever. And uh, she got sick. She was sick all over the place. It was, oh. And the guy next to me, he has like three really strong drinks and passes out and snores really loud. <laughs> <laughs> Two rows in front of me. This guy was just pounding him down. There was a, you know, good looking gal next to him. And he was trying to pick her up, trying to figure out, get her phone number. You know, I'm like, this is my freaking life. <laughs> You know, barfing all over the place, snoring, sleeping wherever, you know, and then trying to pick up on anyone that would possibly listen to me. You know, and so, you know, for, for a moment, I didn't have to take a drink, you know, and back then, you know, people could go to the gates, and I had all my friends from, because my mom had called some friends that she knew, uh, they, they were at the gate, there were about five of them, and took me and held on to me for quite a while. So I could get back on my feet and not feel like I had to cover my feelings, you know, and um, have a drink, you know, and things like that happen all the time now that I'm sober, you know, it's just like if I just get out of the way, I get to watch this stuff happen, you know, I get to see the miracle of sobriety happen around me all the time, um, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing for me to think that I've can stand up here and talk to all your people about my sobriety, you know, because it's like all of a sudden I've got 22 years, and some people say, oh, you've got long-term sobriety. I'm like, I've got 24 hours. Oh, my God. You know? And the things I do for that is, like, when I get up in the morning, I open the book, and I read a few pages out of, you know, the 83, the promise, start with the promises, the end of the, the chapter. Um, that's the 10-step, you know, love and tolerance that I say. 50 times a day, you know, because me, I like to react to people, and, you know, they're stupid people, and they're not acting right, they're not doing what I said, they, you know, and this whole thing, and, uh, you know, even after, you know, quite a few 24 hours, you know, I still get caught up in listening to me, and I have to have that prayer and meditation that I'm not in charge, you know, through the second or third step of, like, finding uh, a higher power that's not me, 
you know, and I remember the exact time I figured that out. You know, sitting in a meeting with the little red church downtown San Cruz, sitting in the window when the window was beating down, and it was like, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid because I'm going to be taken care of if I take these certain steps. You know, when I go through the steps, I help other alcoholics, and I do service. You know, and that's uh, what I try to do. And oh my gosh, I've got some more time. <laughs> <laughs> scared because that was kind of, you know, I'm used to the 20-minute thing. Um, so hopefully, you know, uh, the newcomers, welcome to all the newcomers. I uh, just want to say there is always a chair in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for you. Always, there will always be a chair for you. And, um, you know, I'd say just take a seat and hold on to that chair because it's a wild ride. Um, uh, let's see. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Who else wants to speak for 10 minutes? <laughs> well, I don't know what else to say. I can? Yes. Yes. Really? Yes. Cool. Is that okay, Nikki? Because I'm like, I, I'll just have filler of like, you know, drunk log stuff, and that's kind of that's crazy. So I'm done. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.